welcome to the Impact on the Ground podcast series. I'm Tiia Sammalahti, CEO of whatimpact.com, a tech for good company with the mission to become the LinkedIn of CSR. In this podcast series, we'll dig deeper into what it takes to make an impactful change in our society. I'll give a voice to charities, social enterprises, companies, grant makers, individuals and government officials who all have one thing in common. They are keen to make a difference. We dive into practical solutions and observe the dynamics of those who have resources to give and those working with the beneficiaries on the ground. Let's start making an impact together. Hello, everyone. Uh, today in uh, Impact on the Ground with Tia, we are talking about delivering social value, but uh, also uh, how the government uh, in the UK is now focusing on heavily on social value delivery and is requiring that from uh, many organizations who are working with the government. And there are a lot of incentives to that. But uh, as a little background intro, um, as not everybody probably are not aware of of Social Value Act, which is uh, this kind of public services act, uh, which was originally launched in 2012 by the Parliament of the United Kingdom. And this this act uh, kind of encouraged the, all the uh, government officials who are buying uh, services from different organizations to really favor organizations who can prove that they deliver social value outside of the contracts uh, and uh, uh, who uh, deliver social value being also, also environmental and cultural value, but also economical value. And this uh, act has been kind of voluntary till January 2021. Uh, throughout the years, uh, especially uh, construction industry was evaluated by these standards because the, the, the tenders that they were bidding for were quite valuable. So, uh, but, but it wasn't mandatory. And now the government has taken the stand and really moved things further and, and made any uh, kind of organization applying for uh, government tenders, bidding for them, uh, they have a mandatory, uh, you know, requirement to deliver uh, social value in the society, but also they need to report then quarterly based on some KPIs. So this is the background context when I'm now introducing to you Arnab Dutt, who is my guest of honor today. I would call him Mr. Social Value, I assume. <laughs> is that okay? <laughs> well, um, I, I've never heard that one before. That's That's new and I'm a bit I'm a bit surprised that, you know, but um, if you insist, but Arnab is the name I still prefer. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I, I was, uh, you know, when I heard about you and, um, you know, uh, also then checked your bio, and there is a lot of social value, you know, <laughs> in your bio. So um, you are an entrepreneur uh, and run uh, various companies, but you are very active in social value uh, kind of uh, topic and you are advising government and also you are involved in various uh, uh, kind of committees and task forces to kind of uh, give views on how SMEs especially can deliver social value and how should they go about it. Would you care to tell about a little bit about your background? Of course, I'd be, I'd be happy to and, and, and thank you so much for inviting me on this uh, podcast. I mean, it's, I'm very evangelical about social impact and social value and so every any opportunity i get to speak to a wider audience though i suspect your audience is already convinced but it's always a good uh, it's also a great opportunity to uh, get involved in a dialogue uh, on social value because none of us have the answers uh, because we're on a new journey and we try to do something incredibly important because we're standing on a burning deck and the world is in crisis not just with covid19 but the climate emergency and with our hosting uh, of COP26 in November, it's really important that we have some tangible benefits to say that these are the frameworks and methodologies we're using. We've got something tangible because we realize what's going on. And, you know, I think, you know, Tia, you'll agree with me. Many of us realized the importance of social value, and I'll call it social value, you can call it many different things, many, many years ago. But it was very much part of, it was never part of the mainstream. It was a nice to do. People talked about CSR. 
Now we talk about social value being at the very heart of purpose within government and in business. And that's a, a, a massive shift, which is really important because now we're talking about not tinkering on the edges, but system change, behavior change, driving a whole way of new, new way of looking at how business and the public sector and the value chain works together. And that is the huge challenge. And so you see now that um, everyone's talking about the UN SDGs, 12 of which are social, but you would think that all of it was about carbon and net zero, which isn't the case, but that's the low hanging measurable fruit. Now, like you, I, I sort of was very frustrated some years ago thinking, what are we gonna do about this? And I discovered this wonderful act called the Social Value Act. As you said, 2012, nearly a decade ago. Yeah. And I thought, this is great. Politicians are thinking about it, but it was a piece of luck. It was a private members bill from one MP called Chris White with Lord Newby, a Liberal Democrat. It was taken on board. People thought, this is actually a really good idea. And then it sat on the shelf. It was reviewed in, 12, in 2015. But what happened, because it wasn't mandated, very little was done in central government. A lot of lip service was played, but very little was actually done. In fact, the standard bearers were local government. And you'll see many local governments in the UK looked at social value and thought this is a really good way of helping our communities by setting strategic themes and goals around things like homelessness, around poverty, around fair wages, around sustainability, the circular economy. And they began to mandate themselves within their frameworks and their contracts. Some of them did it well, some of them did it very badly. But those that did it well were able to have huge impacts in their local communities. Yeah. Now, as you know, one of my roles is not just sitting as uh, the chair of the uh, social value working group on the SME panel at Cabinet Office, but I'm also chair of the social value policy unit at the Federation of Small Businesses, which is one of the largest business organizations in the UK. And, and we represent millions of small businesses and micro businesses, as, as well as some social enterprises. Um, and we produced a report in 2019 that showed that small businesses had far greater impact, social impact in their lo local communities than corporates for all their flag waving and all their wonderful reporting telling you how brilliant they are. The real impact was on the ground with small businesses. We found they donated more, they um, were absolutely engaged in their local communities ar around areas like, um, you know, sort of um, education, STEM, um, they were hiring older people, they were hiring NEETs, they were hiring uh, people with, uh, who were otherly abled in far greater quantities. And so once we start, started doing the research, we saw that the approach to social value couldn't be just top down. It could be just the government, which is really important setting the strategic goals, and then corporates telling, telling us how wonderful they are. But you had to get SMEs involved. Yep. You know, if, if, if we're really gonna deliver uh, those goals by 2050 or 2030, we need to involve all those wonderful small businesses, educate them how to change their behaviors and join us. Because even those little changes, if you aggregate them, take us further down the road to achieving those goals around the UN SDGs. And there's a great role that um, social enterprises and charities working with SMEs can also play. So, you know, I can see, you know, and so, so therefore my role in government was to really push this agenda. And it was very difficult, as you can imagine, because everyone was saying, well, that's very, very good, but it's not possible. We can't do this. And then something dramatically awful happened. COVID-19 pandemic struck the world. Yeah. And suddenly we had to start doing everything differently and almost counterintuitively to how we'd done things before because the whole environment had changed. And we suddenly realized that the world was a different place. Yeah, before I go to this next phase, I mean, what 
that COVID escalated everything and then things started to happen. But I, I remember when setting up what impact uh, originally and, and uh, you know, obviously working with a lot of this social value stuff. And I paid attention to this uh, social value act already maybe three, four years ago. And I was just wondering that, I mean, I said, that this is amazing when I learned about it. I said that this must like change the whole UK. I mean, this is kind of a route to change in the society. And then it was exactly the same, you know, kind of response what I, what I got because it wasn't mandatory. And for the listeners, by the way, if you're a government official, they create a tender for anything that they are buying. Uh, the value of this social value can, can count for 10 to 30 percent of the bid. So kind of when they are counting the points. And so it, it, it's a, it has a huge incentive for, for the companies to really focus on delivering the value. If they're getting the wrong work, they could then deliver some other value to the society. But if the government officials were not applying it because it wasn't mandatory, or they could just, uh, you know, kind of approve this kind of ticker box, like a couple of data fields, somebody saying, we have a volunteering program, and yes, we deliver a greatly value, da, 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 and the US is like, okay, let's, let's make this pass. Obviously, there was no value gained. And, uh, and I, uh, once I sat in, a, in Manchester area in a conference, it was social enterprise related, big kind of a conference. And there were a few government officials and I, I, I sat with them and I said that this is a huge opportunity that why isn't this like more widely like promoted that this is like amazing. And I said that, how, how do you evaluate then that these companies that if they don't have this kind of standardized impact reporting system or some kind of that, what did the charities or social enterprises that they supported, what did they achieve? Because it's very rarely that the companies actually deliver the beneficiary work themselves. Yeah, they are yeah. usually supporting other organizations who then do the work on the crowd. So the compact can, company cannot know the impact unless they are reported by the charities or social enterprises. Uh, and, uh, and the government officer says, yeah, we are so experienced that it's fine. We can see from the application when they fill this, some data field that are they, you know, really delivering or not. And I was like, what? And they said that, yeah, yeah, yeah. There is no point of having any like a complicated tools or anything like templates because we can see it whether it's true or not. And I was just like, can this be like true? And then yes, everything changed. Now we're talking about social value KPIs, you know, quarterly reporting. And yes, we can talk about the challenges a little bit later, but tell, tell me what happened when the COVID hit. How, how were things escalated? So yeah, ab absolutely. You know, and, and I, I completely agree with everything you've said in terms of the pushback and a very, very um, uh, unorthodox, unusual way of looking at social value, which actually uh, demonstrated to me, and I'm sure it demonstrated to you here, that really these people had no idea. Mm and they, they were tinkering around the edges because you have to have a methodology, you have to have a framework, you have some, you have to develop formal models and structures because we are, this is a nascent um, piece of work and we stand on, as I said, a new frontier. How do we, how do we make this work? And I think what happened with COVID-19, it accelerated the process. We realized how fragile our, uh, our, our value chains were, our supply chains were globally. We realized that actually the greatest impact, you know, who was making the greatest impact during the COVID-19, uh, uh, you know, pandemic and who continues to, was it, was it the, uh, was it the investment banker or was it the guy in the corner shop delivering, uh, you know, the groceries to your grandmother? Yeah. Make sure she was safe, checking up on her yeah. um, and, and supporting their local community, you know? So then, you know, you suddenly have to look at, you know, what is the great, greater value to our, our society, you know, you know, and, and who is doing the hard lifting, you know? And, 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 and what is their impact? And perhaps we've never been measuring the impact, yeah. you know, of all of these other areas that really actually glue our society together. So I think there was a, a there's a slow realization. I think that was accelerated by COVID-19 because we had to face the reality. We had to start doing things. So we began to appreciate the importance of data. We began to in, 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 uh, appreciate the importance of digital platforms, the ability for us to function using technology like as we're using today yep. to communicate with, you know, and, and to disseminate this data and to democratize the process. 
And so we discovered and began, were forced to use new capabilities, do things differently. And I think that was the catalyst for why it became important. And then how do we recover from this pandemic? You know, how do we, if, we, if we've now been able to identify because COVID-19 really made us understand, you know, the inequality, the fact that COVID-19 was not an equal opportunity killer. For some of us who are lucky to have uh, homes outside or live different lives and have the digital connections, we were safe. But for those at the other end of society who are on the front line, who put themselves at risk every day, just doing their normal jobs, we realized that, you know, this was a really unequal place and we had to, we have to do better in the future. Mm. And all of that realization, I think, has impacted governments across the world, left or right. And now we need leadership in determining what, how we go forward. We understand within all of that, the climate emergency and social justice walk hand in hand. I think if we didn't know it before, mm. we know it now after COVID. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. So I think these were the, these were the catalysts for behavioral change within central government. Central government then started talking to the local governments that have been doing some really good work on deploying social value and for the first time began to learn from best practice and exemplars. Then we had from the mandation of last year and I was obviously very involved in uh, PPN 0620, yeah. which is the, uh, that paper, I was hugely involved in that and very grateful when it was, when it was launched, really happy because for the first time we were saying, you cannot ignore this mm. to the corporate supply chain and you have to involve your whole supply chain. And it was a way that government could show leadership and then say to businesses, you need to help us find solutions. These are the big overreaching themes around social value, around impact, you know, and you need to get involved. And suddenly after that, we were having conversations with all the big multinational companies who mm. could see the uh, framework around non-financial reporting coming towards them, the fact that governments everywhere were talking about this and the government was saying, unless you prove to us that you're actually doing something about this, you won't win any business. So then it became a matter of competitive advantage as well. Because if, if, you, if you can't win business, you can't grow your business. Yes. And, and that message went, is, is now going all the way down the value chain. Yeah. And that means it is making people think differently and that is when system change happens, when yeah. you start changing behaviours. And I think that has, you know, the PPN06 and the mandation has been probably the, a leap forward uh, to push us on this new trajectory. And recently we had PPN0621, which is now the new government uh, guidelines on carbon, which will be now mandated from September. This piece needs to be developed and I was involved in that too. Mm. It means that got any business over 5 million cannot ignore their carbon footprint in reporting and telling us how they're going to improve it. Yeah. And, and I think that is another huge step forward. It's not perfect and I think it will need to develop and we will have to iterate it and we'll probably have to make it more user friendly. But it's made people sit up and think, hang on, I need to address this. I can't ignore it anymore. Yes, this is now mandated. Yes, and I think uh, that's uh, that's has been always a big interest to me. Uh, you know, already like two thousand and seven, when actually I got originally the idea of what impact through my own work. That you know, there is always, you know, kind of the government involvement has to be kind of evaluated. Although we we might think in the Western world that government shouldn't you know, interfere in the everything, but we also know the power of regulations. Yeah. In yeah. some cases, it has to be regulated in order it to happen, whether it's plastic bag, you know, <laughs> you know, uh, initiative, that was the only way to stop people actually just like exploiting plastic bags and using them like madly. And uh, then when the regulation come, then the real change can be begin. Yeah. And I think in here, it's a beautiful thing that it, it came because it's not just only that, oh, now there are more demands for the companies. They are actually pushed forward even in global competitiveness wise, because we know that it's not about the UK. It's about also other markets. A lot of companies are exporting, doing uh, international trading and stuff. And if you really 
uh, invest in social value, you will be growing your business value. And that's already proven in several, several academic studies that your uh, value within uh, 10, 15 years time as a company can be, there are va like variation, but between four to 11% higher than any organization who don't care. So it's kind of probably pushing even the whole UK market to in a better competitive uh, position in global sense, because uh, companies are more prepared. But uh, about uh, this um, uh, uh, social value act. So now companies, whoever are now bidding for government tender, they have to now prove that they are already doing something uh, like uh, some local or wherever their kind of the, uh, the work would take place in that area. They're delivering additional social and environmental value. And then they are, if they win the bid, they will have to set up certain KPIs and then they report uh, back. So uh, we at What Impact believe in uh, really like impact reporting. Of course, it has to be measured first in order to be reported, but we have built quite extensive quite qualitative tool for any kind of data to be utilized. Uh, so you can really report back. And also we have applied these new government uh, outcome criteria, what UK government is enhancing with this, uh, this uh, new procurement policy note. But what do you think then, how are the government officials who are actually procurement people, and they are now evaluating the results, how do they get these like uh, capabilities and, and, and so on, because they were not trained for this kind of information. How do they go about it then? You know, your, your question is absolutely spot on. And this is a huge challenge that was recognized in government last year. So we've, and, and as you know, the transactional nature of procurement has always been lowest price delivery mm -hmm. of time. And for many people, that's all they've been trained to do for 20 years in public yeah. procurement. OK, how do you change the behavior of the commissioning? And, you know, your question is absolutely right question. Yes, this is hard for us who work with this every day. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But, you know, you're asking the right question. So and, and, and it, it is it is one that is not just in the public sector. It goes right across the large corporates yes. as well. And we have to address it. So the first thing, uh, you know, we, we they were doing in government. And I said, you know, you have to change commissioning. And so a program was instituted in the middle of last year um, in central government, which is to train 32,000 people who are involved in public commissioning um, in social value, yeah. what it means, why they have to do it and why it's important. And then the new metrics that are gonna be involved. So central government has set up an, a new set of internal metrics on, on social value okay uh and they're qualitative rather than quantitative you know um so they're not using giant spreadsheets which frankly seem to be i think we've spoken about this before the easy way of doing things but they're not necessarily the best not now every every area from qualitative to quantitative has its place but i think getting the balance right is the road we're tra trying to tr achieve at the moment yeah. but the qualitative criteria is so important and i think it was left to one side because it was easier to develop the quantitative side. Now, with, with central government, they've realized that, but over the last year, they've engaged with about 3000 commissioners, which still leaves the other 90% to train. So this is a long road. Yeah. How do we do it? You know, so there's, 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 there's a gap there, you know, that we need to address on, on getting the training out, you know, um, to commissioners about how, how they approach frameworks and bids, how do we change their mindset, how do we align them with UNSDG mapping, looking at a contract and saying, how does it map up, up, out against the UNSDGs? So there's another challenge there and a task that we have to address. Then you've got the other side of the balance is you can train commissioners and we have to do that. But on the other side, you need to chain, train the supply chain itself. They need to understand what is social value. They have their own criteria and their behavior is we need to survive. There's a pandemic going on. We would love to be doing social value and impact and saving the planet, but we need to save our business first. So we need to educate them and say, actually, if you do this, you save your business in the long yeah, run. Yeah. Actually. So this is absolutely a commercial benefit 
as well as you doing something incredibly impactful and helping you grow. It helps you um, join supply chains, whether they're corporate or public. But more importantly, it makes your business really resilient. That's another huge challenge for all of us, getting that message across, getting the education, getting that training. So as I say to you, Tia, I think we have a huge challenge. I think there's never been a moment where so many people across the world uh, are saying to us, you know, help us find a solution. You know, you see it from the demonstrations, you've seen Greta, you've seen young people take up this challenge, and you've seen lots of people who were pushing against us now saying, we need to do this. So in a way, the moment is right, even though you and I have been talking about this for so many years, <laughs> banging our heads, trying to shake people up and say, look, we have to do this. And I think this is the moment. And maybe it's come because of this awful pandemic. It's opened open doors, which were closed to us before, but we have some big challenges. And I think, yeah, and you've identified one of the biggest ones, which is how we train commissioners to think in this way as they commission contracts and pieces of work in the public sector or private sector. But at the same time, we really need to address the lack of education in the supply chain about the benefits of social impact. Yeah. And I guess we, we at what, what impact we work <clears throat> a lot with a different size and type of companies and, and who, who are, you know, considering or are on our platform. And uh, there are two ways to kind of think about this, that it's not only kind of charitable giving, it's uh, because you, you formulate partnerships with, they may be charities, social enterprises who actually have the beneficiary angle in their work, but that, that partnership can be, of course, donation-based, it can be shared skills, it can be also supply chain. So you, you maybe buy some services from the social enterprise who actually benefits or hires, uh, you know, disabled people or, or something. So there comes the value within the partnerships. So it's not just like that kind of a giving some kind of handouts and then reporting that we did this for the government. It's about actually benefiting yourself uh, at the same time. So, um, you know, I think it's now important, like you said, that uh, the reporting is said to be qualitative, but also then where does the qualitative data come from? that would be validated. And that has been our, uh, our kind of concern that some companies are trying to formulate the data themselves from yeah. bits and pieces. They collect them from now and then they are creating this fantastic impact report. And when you start to actually looking at it, you know, it's not validated because they have made it for their benefit because it wasn't provided the organization uh, who actually did the work within the beneficiaries who should be collecting the data. You, can, uh, you cannot know if the project was maybe unsuccessful and it created negative impact. And so that's why it's also very tricky when you said that uh, it's more qualitative data that if you put these in the numerics and say that now you gave 100,000 pounds for this charity to help the homelessness. And then you say, actually, we delivered a half a million value with 100,000 pounds because that's what homelessness kind of inputs deliver. We all know that that charity that you donated to is a very different from another homelessness charity. Even their methods of solving the problem within the homelessness you know, you know, are different. So the impact can never be same. Yeah, you're, you're, you're absolutely right. I completely agree with you. You know, and I, I think what, what else is that? I think the, the other stage is, is how do we measure, measure legacy? Because, you know, it's, it's a case of at the moment there is too much. Let's measure the project. Let's put in a bunch of quanti quantifications around, as you said, what we think are measurable is, but they're made up, which also leads to a lot of greenwashing and social washing. Yeah. So you have different standards. And we see a lot of the corporates gaming those standards uh, and they're coming out with these wonderful reports. But at the moment you um, do a little bit of research and dig below and see what's the substance and evidence, yes. it doesn't exist. Yep. And therefore, you know, and, and, and this is another area which you know, we have to address, I think, you know, and I think the, the, the value of what impact, the value of what impact is, I think the system you're developing is a really efficient way not only of joining up resources and using them efficiently and, and amplifying the impact, but it's a great way of getting, it's almost like a dating service I, I, in my eyes. Yeah, between yeah, no, yeah. yeah, 
you know, between those even small companies who don't know how but want to and have the resources to do some really impactful stuff and those corporates who need to demonstrate it. And actually, you know, I, I think, of course, it needs, needs to be developed, but it's, I think it's a very important part of how we go forward, that mix of joining the two. And then from that will come great examples of where the supply chain and charities and social enterprises and corporates and SMEs can work together. I mean, I always say, you know, if you've got an SME who's come to me and said, look, we want to do some good. We really want to do some social impact stuff, you know, but we don't know how. So I say, are, are there any local charities in your area doing really good work with needs, with ex-offenders, with ex-service people, with ex-drug abusers? Why don't you talk to them? Work with them because they have the constituency. They will, they will help you, you know, put together a program and supply and, and really engage with those constituencies of people that need to be left behind. Are you looking at the environment? There's probably charities near you who are who've got fantastic expertise, you know, environmental measures, how to deploy them, right? Speak to them. Don't reinvent the wheel yourself. No, no. Work, work, find coalitions of working together. And and and, and I think you know what, what you're doing is superb. And I've always said that is the way forward, you know, getting people to together. To provide those solutions, get looking at the, where the expertise is, and engaging with those people and those individuals and those organisations where the expertise lies to help you. And you and the idea of not laying, let, letting it lay dormant, but having it available all the time, I think is fantastic. So, what do you say about this? Uh, because I'm, um, uh, you know, we're, we've been to, uh, now developing the social impact reporting tool, and like I said, it's very qualitative data. It has all the validation points and it suits for any charity, any projects. And that's what we recommend that the companies rely on because the company didn't do the work. It's yeah. the actual the social value organization. Companies help them to do with their resources and, uh, and, and, and skills. Uh, but what if this now the gap in the market where the procurement officers don't really know how to evaluate this qualitative data uh, there are tools to measure, like I said, that if you put 100,000 to homelessness, the value would be 500,000. So what about if then, because of the lack of training and it's taking so long, these like a proxy-based evaluation criteria will take over the qualitative stuff. And then it, you know, then only certain courses that are uh, kind of delivering high impact based on average data not as that they, as a local uh, single charity, but as a course related, like uh, average data. What about then if all the resources are given to these most impactful kind of courses and activities, although the community would need totally something else? Is there a risk in that? Yeah, I think there's definitely a risk. I mean, we can see it happening already. Oh. Know? And I, so how we do this, because, you know, I've got, you know, you, know, you and I know, uh, around data reporting it's the wild west out there and mm. even around standards no one can come together to develop some sort of unified standard and also the other big danger is that we got just go for low-hanging fruit and or make the whole methodology prescriptive whereby you know which which alienates a lot of small companies and a lot of businesses because they just can't do this yeah. and we should not be saying to the market this is how you do it, okay? And certainly government shouldn't be doing that and standards authorities and regulators shouldn't be doing that. They should be setting high level goals and setting up frameworks. But within that, there should be space for fluidity and innovation yeah. for solving problems, right? In a way that's practicable and actually relates to the actual problem we're trying to solve and measuring that legacy because there is no one size fits all and you know i think you're, you're quite quite right you've identified a real risk and a real danger um which you know i'm looking into and i can already see it developing mm -hmm. and we've seen it through some of the sustainability indexes yeah and i mean you know the idea you know on, on the idea that someone like on, on the russell index i think we saw you know in the top 10 um top ESG rated firms, we have British American Tobacco, we have mining companies, we have fossil fuel companies, and you have to wonder, really? 
Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> really? You know? Yeah. I, I'm not, you know, I, I, I'm not attacking, uh, you know, the, 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 the need or the want of many legacy businesses to have an impact and change the world. But I, I, it really makes me wonder about the methodologies. Yeah. Where, where, where you're, you're, you're getting what I call perverse outcomes. Yeah. And I think, you know, you were saying that, you know, your uh, research amongst SMEs, you know, kind of uh, gave the result that, you know, the SMEs are actually many times much more impactful source of value providers. And it has to do with the fact that they know what's going on in their neighborhood. Yeah. Because uh, if this proxy gives you a high impact score on helping homelessness, but what about if that's not the problem in your neighborhood? But there is like a drug use might be uh, amongst young people. You know that might be the pressing issue, which actually could ruin the life of hundreds of young people, and they will be, you know, forever and ever, you know, unemployed and whatnot if they go to that bad route. That's what you should tackle. But if that's not rated as a most impactful in some proxy, you would be choosing to help the homeless, which is not needed in the area, because you just want to get higher points, you know, for your bid. Exactly. That's the danger. And that's why I say it can't be prescriptive. You have to leave room for innovation on the ground, whereby the local communities and the businesses and the social enterprises work together to say, these are the headline strategic challenges on the ground in our local communities. Yeah. Right? These are the ones we will address. Yeah. That has to be the way forward. And as I think we've spoken before, if we can do that amongst the small companies who in the UK employ 61% of the workforce and in developing countries, small businesses employ 90%. Yeah. Now, the impact they make on the ground. Yeah. Okay, even little impacts. If we can benchmark and measure the aggregate impact of all those small businesses, it far outweighs those large, wonderful corporates producing their reports. That is how we win. That's how we achieve the UN SDGs. That's how we make the change that's necessary. And that will make evolutionary system change because once that's embedded, it takes root and it becomes a core purpose of all business all yeah. the way down the supply chain from how government sets the agenda and corporates have to work within that, you know? So that it, it's really, it's not, it cannot be just top down. It yeah. has to be, you know, bottom up as well, you know? Uh, this is nuanced, this is, this is hard, you know? It's not gonna be easy. Yeah. And the way we are, the, there's no way we're gonna do this through being overly prescriptive. We've got to let innovation, disruption, entrepreneurship, and small businesses and uh, social enterprises who are, who are doing amazing work out there um, be able to guide and take the lead and set the direction and say, this is what we need. Don't tell us what we need. We're going to tell you what we need. Help us deliver. Yeah. That's how we make the change. So what do you, what do you say as a, your last advice to SMEs now who are, you know, kind of, uh, you know, bidding for tenders, they want to work with government, they could be actually growing their business quite a bit by winning deals. What, what would you do as a SME entrepreneur? How would you go about it? Because you know that on the counter side, the procurement officers might not be exactly ready, and maybe you're not. What, what's the way forward? You know, I think the, at a local level, I think it's really worth talking to lots of organizations that are working within social impact and there may be local organizations in your area that are doing that charities social enterprises i then look at your local council because we have noticed and we and this is certainly true that in local government there are they've been far more advanced there's a level of maturity around social value and social impact right and i would say to you go and talk to them look about how you might um, onboard onto a government supply chain look at their frameworks engage with them talk to them and, and because obviously there's a great resilience especially in the future of having public sector 
uh, contracts yep. because it gives you a sense of stability and you can certainly scale as a small business owner I would say practically it's a great way to scale up your business if you have the if, if you have the uh, sort of um, stability of a public sector procurement contract at the same time there's it's a great place to go and get some advice so keep it local to start with keep it in your local council maybe you know in your metropolitan area but begin to talk and have conversations uh, with your LEP and and find out through organizations like NCVO where you can partner. So take little steps, you know, no one's expecting you to suddenly understand social value, mm. but begin to educate yourself about the matter. Have a look at the contract frameworks, understand the UN SDGs, you know, just take little small bite-sized pieces on a journey, like on, on this journey, you know, and that's the best advice. Begin to educate, begin to understand. Don't necessarily jump in, and then you can start evaluating what small changes can you make in your business? Maybe where you get your supply is fuel from. Is, 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 is it renewable energy? You know, how lean is your business? Look at your mix around gender and around um, sort of local impact. You know, who are you hiring? Look at the work, your, the makeup of your workforce. You know, what procedures can you change to, to produce less weight? You know, it's all these little things yeah. that you can do, which in aggregate are just huge. You know, so you know, that, that, that's that's the advice I would give, you know, begin, 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 begin by doing little steps, little steps within your organization and start having conversations with those who've already begun that journey. Right. And, and definitely with your local authorities, local councils and the NC and organizations like NCVO. Mm, definitely. And I would add to that, that, of course, the whole kind of the, you know, kind of the outcome criteria is what government have now set up in the social value po policy you know they are very broad and are linked like you said to uh, carbon footprint and employment and all that but uh, what i want to kind of bring out here that you know this kind of community engagement bit with where what entails maybe corporate giving skills maybe donating products services giving local grants supporting fundraising for charities you know we have built in what impact a lot of material to help especially SMEs to understand. So we've been studying and creating documents that, you know, help them to create strategies. They know how, how to kind of build up. And of course, then the social impact reporting tool will just automatically report on the government kind of outcome criteria if yeah. it has to be to do with the community engagement activities. But like I said, that there are, and you are mentioning a lot of other things that their companies have to also, you know, do. So it's a it's a big, big learning process and they should really invest in it. But I just heard uh, some news and I was really impressed. There was this quite large legal agency, but ob obviously has been an SME and I don't know exactly how many hundreds of people they at the moment hire, but they have made their uh, uh, head of uh, CSR uh, partner in their company, which so she is not the lawyer. So I think it's a very rare news that, you know, legal agency, which usually just names lawyers as partners, actually yeah. named the CSR director. And I talked with the, one of the employees and I was like, wow, that's quite new. And she said that, yeah, CSR is actually the, uh, the pinpoint in their whole uh, company strategy that you know they they have really adapted that and and we see this now uh, with some customers who are coming coming in and they're really focusing on that and and that means that these companies will do well in government procurement you know uh, systems but of course other, other ways otherwise too because the customers and also employees pretty much expect the organizations to deliver value otherwise they don't want to be in, involved anymore Absolutely. So I think, you know, your your portal is a really good place to start too. And I would say to everyone, obviously, I'm going to put my Federation of Small Business hat on. Yep. Come and have a look at the website. Um, we've partnered with the Better Business, uh, at, you know, so we're looking at, you know, the, 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 the 10 fundamentals around what we think is better business around, you know, sort of um, uh, fair pay, uh, around skills, around apprenticeships, around equality, around gender, a commitment to all these things. And this is really, really important. So small steps, even begin with a, a, a commitment and say, right, this is the direction of where our organization is going to go and, and take that first step. So I think, you know, there's, there's a lot um, that small businesses can do. 
there yeah. are growing resources and i would you know ask them to have a look at those resources including yours tia you know mm. yeah in, and begin to educate yourselves you know because you will have to do this yeah so, you know it, it, there's no like it's not a case of you can stand back from the world as it as yeah. it moves forward if you want to play a part and grow your business you're going to have to engage with this and better do it well and better to be invested in this and you, with the front runner companies and be one of them yeah show leadership and, you know chasing other companies and maybe not make it in the meantime yeah absolutely absolutely mm. Hey, thank you, Arnold, for this lovely conversation. And uh, yes, we will be uh, continuing and uh, I will invite you to our social impact reporting tool demo. You might find it interesting. <laughs> that would be great. I look forward to it. Yeah. OK, but thank you so much and uh, speak to you soon. It's been a pleasure. Thank you, Tia. So thank you for tuning into What Impact on the Crown podcast. It's been great to have you with us. I'm Tiia Sammalahti, CEO of whatimpact.com, a tech for good company with the mission to become the LinkedIn of CSR. Whether you are a company with resources to give or a charity or social enterprise looking for resources to make an impact, check out our platform and start your free trial now. Let's make a difference together.